Let us pray. And now we humble ourselves before God Almighty, whose grace has gifted us and whose love has saved us. Patiently now we wait for thee. Your word is a lamp to our paths and a light to our feet. May the Holy Spirit strengthen me to deliver a word of power so that many to Jesus will come and meet. Amen. Question. If we had to break all of Christianity down into one lesson, into one word, what would that word be? Jesus. Now, if we can break the entire Christian faith down into one word, into one concept, which embodies the grace, the love of God, then why does religion often feel so complicated? Why does God often feel so complicated? If it's just that simple, why does God often feel so far away? Jesus, I dare say, would share some of my same questions. Because Jesus was a simplifier. This is what Jesus did. Jesus comes on the scene, and he tells everyone, listen, you guys have 600 plus laws you're following that guide everyday life. I'm going to give you a new lesson. Open up your religion notebooks. Lesson one, love God. Lesson two, love your neighbor. Now, close your books, put your pens down. Jesus would have then extended his mic, turned it sideways, and dropped it and walked away. Simple. Jesus kept things simple. Jesus never would have given a PowerPoint presentation. In a Bible study lesson written by Jesus, he would never have any footnotes. He kept things simple. He told stories. He told tales about lost sheep and lost coins and fathers and sons and mustard seeds. He kept things simple. And because he was a simplifier, he did us the favor of breaking down the crux, the core of Christianity, into one verse. John 3.16. And what does John 3.16 say? Even if you don't like the Bible, you probably have an idea of what this verse says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Interesting point. That verse in my Bible is 133 characters, which means Jesus sums up Christianity in one tweet. Simple. And his message was so basic. God loves the world, so he sent me. If you believe in me, you will not die. You will live forever. Simple. And what does believe mean? It means to trust in, to commit oneself to, to rely on. Simple. Now, many people may know what John 3.16 says, but they may not know why Jesus said it. John 3.16 is actually a simple answer to a very complicated question. And that question was asked by Nicodemus in John 3.9. There, Nicodemus asked, how can these things be? 
Nicodemus came from a religious tradition that was complicated, that had an incessant number of rules, where you had to jump continuously through hoops for a God that was very, very far away. And if you made one mistake, you had to go all the way back to the beginning. Life was complicated. Religion was complicated. So when Jesus says, listen, you guys have made it so complicated, no one is getting saved. I'm going to make it simple. Just do one thing, believe. Which blew Nicodemus' mind. He said, it can't be that simple. How can these things be? And the lesson this exchange has for us in 2016 is simple. Because oftentimes we can get caught up in the intricacies of religion, in all the peripheral stuff. We can be steered away from the basic simplicity of Jesus' message. That at the core of it, all you have to do is simple. You must first believe. And the purpose of this message is to expose three different complications that pollutes, that makes unnecessarily complex your relationship with God. And by removing these complications, you can draw closer to him. So if that's a message you want to hear, give me an amen. Complication number one, guilt. The first complication that puts you farther away from God is guilt. So John 3, 1 to 2 says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So we have to be careful because the Bible says Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, but doesn't say why he came to Jesus by night. Some Bible scholars say Jesus was simply too busy during the day. So Nicodemus came at a more opportune time. Other Bible scholars say that because Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a group that weren't really big fans of Jesus. He was ashamed to be seen with Jesus during the day. So he came under the secrecy of night. What we can say symbolically is that Nicodemus was someone who was in the darkness and he was approaching a God who is the light. And similar to us today, one of the things that can symbolically keep us in the darkness, away from the light, God, is guilt. So what is guilt? There's objective guilt and subjective guilt. Guilt is what happens when you violate a rule, when you do something wrong, when you break a commandment. So if a man steals a woman's purse, he's guilty of theft. Guilty feelings, on the other hand, is your own personal response to your guilt. So a professional thief, for example, may steal your purse. He's guilty, but have no guilty feelings whatsoever. You, on the other hand, may take a quarter from someone. You're guilty of theft, but you can't sleep at night because you're racked by guilty feelings. 
And here's the funny thing about modern society. Guilt is what keeps us in the darkness because we're ashamed to step out into the light. We're ashamed of our guilt. We're ashamed of what we've done. And if we expose ourselves in the light, we're afraid we're going to have to look at ourselves, and others will look at our guilt. But what society will try to do is develop a lot of ways for us to deal with our guilty feelings, but not our guilt. They'll say things like, everyone else is doing it, so you shouldn't feel so bad. That makes the guilty feelings go away, but not the guilt. They'll also things, say things like, just approach the person and make amends. Let it be a life learning example so you don't feel so bad. And our feelings will go away, but our guilt still remains. And this is how religion can complicate stuff. Because sometimes religion can say, look at yourself. You're shameful. God's not going to have any mercy on you. You should get yourself together first and then step into the light. There is no mercy for you because your guilt has broken a specific limit. Now, no matter what strategy we use to deal with our guilty feelings, when we all face judgment and stand before God, and we push all of our guilt, all of our wrongs, all of our sins in front of him, God, being just, will look at our guilt and always say, guilty. Now that's the bad news, but here's the good news. Nicodemus would have had that version of God in his mind, the complicated, judgmental, can't do anything wrong. And Jesus would say, listen, Nicodemus, you may know a lot about me, you may know a lot about my rules. You may have heard a lot of things from other people about me. But what you fail to realize, Nicodemus, is that I am God standing right here in front of you. And what I'm about is eternal life. Because God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. For whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. Jesus would say, listen, you guys have been doing this complicated thing for generations and generations, but nobody is getting saved. I'm about eternal life. It profits me nothing to see you condemned in eternity. The entire point, my entire goal, is to bring you life, is to impart upon you salvation. So yes, you may know a lot about me, but you fail to grasp what I'm all about, eternal life. And this is where it gets really good. Because the only true, legitimate cure for guilt is real forgiveness based on the real mercy, based on the real atoning blood of Jesus Christ, whom we must believe in to have eternal life. Because in the final judgment, when we are in God's courtroom, it doesn't matter how much guilt we put in front of him. Even God would look all the way up to the heavens and say, my goodness, look at all this guilt. And all he has to do is look at one drop of the blood of Jesus Christ. And the verdict is always the same. 
not guilty. For as it says in 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. As it says in John 3, 17 to 18, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Consider for a second that the only thing that we can actually do for God is bring him our guilt, bring him our sins. And as we approach the cross in humility and bring our sins to the foot of the cross, it is leaning on that cross and trusting in and believing in him which will bring us salvation, which will bring us eternal life. Dare to believe that no matter how bad your guilt is, it is never a match for the blood of Jesus Christ. So you may be in the darkness, but guess what? The more guilt you have, the more of it God can solve. So if you're in the darkness feeling ashamed, if you feel guilty, if you feel vulnerable and impeded from stepping into the light, the bigger your problem is, the bigger a solution Jesus will provide. And the reason why is simple, because God so loved the world, and you know the rest. The second thing that complicates your relationship with God is twisted belief. Twisted belief. Turn to someone and say, do not get it twisted. First part of this point. It doesn't matter what other people do. The only thing that matters is simple belief in Christ Jesus. Tell me if this sounds familiar. You have a family member, or you know someone, you have a co worker who has one foot in the church and one foot somewhere else doesn't matter where the somewhere else is. And all they need is one excuse, one good front page New York Times scandal, pastor court doing something. One expose into the local church to say, I'm done. That's it. This God religion stuff, I can't take it anymore. I just can't deal with it. This is the type of person that puts their faith in a person. They put their faith in an institution. So when that something else fails or lets them down, it produces a whole bunch of doubt. And that doubt can grow and grow and grow and grow and, cost and cast a long shadow and they feel comfortable in the shadow of their doubt because if they step out of the shadow into the light, they're afraid they're gonna be hurt again because they said, that pastor, that church, that elder, they let me down before. But notice the irony, because if you put your faith in something else, you're essentially turning salvation into a poker game where you take all of your chips and hand it over to someone else. And if they happen to play a bad hand, everything is lost. And the problem is that we're not talking about $100. We're not talking about your car keys. We're not talking about a mortgage. We're talking about eternity, which is an irrevocable choice. So why would we ever gamble? 
because it doesn't matter. Don't get it twisted. It doesn't matter what other people believe or what other people do. The only thing that does matter is simple. Belief in Christ Jesus. If you ask me what I was about when I was eight, I would say video games and comic books. If you ask me what I was about when I was 18, it would be becoming somebody. If you asked me what I was about when I was 28, I would say settling down. I change. If you ask me what I'm going to be about when I'm 50, I don't, I don't have an answer for you. So I'm constantly changing. There is no stability. So why would you ever put your faith and trust in me? God knows life can be complicated, so he wants to keep things simple. So the only thing you have to do is not believe in me or someone else. It's belief in Christ Jesus. The eight-year-old version of me is drastically different than the version of me now. But you know what? The same Jesus that we can read about now is the same Jesus we read about 2,000 years ago, not changing. The same John 3.16 that we are reading now in New York is the same John 3.16 someone read in Latin in Europe in the year 1100. He's not changing. That is someone I want to believe in because don't get it twisted. It doesn't matter what other people do. The answer is simple, Jesus. Now you may be sitting there, have your headphones in, across the world, you're at home right now saying, all right, preacher man, I like where you're going a little bit, but I can't bind this religion stuff, you know, 100%. I can only hang on to maybe 10% of what you're saying. I can only take a bite, just a, a small nibble of everything you're preaching. To which I would respond, don't get it twisted. It doesn't matter how much you believe. What does matter is simple. Belief in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter the strength of your faith. It matters what the object of your faith is. Another way of saying that, which sounds more fancy. John 3.16 never quantifies faith. It never measures it qualifies it as in what that faith is in. John 3.16 does not say, for whosoever believes a lot. It doesn't say, for whosoever believes moderately. It doesn't say, for whosoever believes 20%. It says, for whosoever believes what? In Christ Jesus. Think about this for a second. We are all ships on the sea of life, right? Our faith, our belief is a chain which connects us to an anchor. That anchor is the object of our faith. So let's say you have a whole, let's say you're rich and you have a whole lot of faith, meaning that chain is big and heavy but you have a whole lot of faith in your bank account. That's your anchor, what your faith is in. What happens when a judgment wave of God comes? God looks at that anchor and says, can't stand up to me. And that wave begins rocking your ship and the ship is struggling. The chain begins to twist and it breaks because that anchor had no eternal value. So what's the value of that faith? Nothing. You had a whole lot of faith in a non-eternal 
object. But when you have belief in Christ Jesus, that anchor is now an immovable, unshakable object. So all you need is a mustard seed's worth of faith, of belief, which means the chain connecting your ship to the anchor is barely even visible. But because you're attached to the anchor of Jesus, that anchor now imputes strength to the chain. So when the judgment wave of God comes, and he sees the anchor with the Son of God written on it, he says, I can't even touch that. And your ship stays still. Because it doesn't matter how much you believe. What does matter is simple. Belief in Christ Jesus. Last part of this point. It doesn't matter if it's belief with. What does matter is belief in Christ Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Is faith compatible with doubt? Is faith compatible with doubt. I'm going to answer by telling you a story. So Matthew 14, Jesus with his disciples, they feed 5,000. So the day is over. Jesus tells his disciples, you guys get in a boat, you get in the lake, and you travel to the next destination. I'll catch up with you later. I have some senior pastor stuff to take care of. So I'm going to go up on this mountain. I'm going to pray to God. You just go ahead. Disciples say, okay. Hours pass by. And now the disciples are in the middle of the lake. But the weather gets bad. The winds, as pastor would say, were contrary. And the boat was being rocked back and forth. So Jesus, in typical Jesus fashion, walks on the water. And all of the disciples say, it must be a ghost. And Jesus says, everybody keep calm. It is me, Jesus. And then Peter because he was unsure, he was uncertain, he said, Jesus, if it is really you, because I can't be 100% sure, then command me to walk on the water. Jesus says, come on. So Peter gets out of the boat, and he takes a step. He's like, this is cool. I'm walking on water. There's wind around me, step by step by step. And then, Matthew tells us, Peter sees the wind, and he gets shook. He gets scared, and he falls into the water. And then, now he knows it's the Lord, right? Because he says, Jesus, save me. And Jesus walks over, extends his hand, and in Matthew 14, 31, he says, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, let's break this down logically. Peter had a little bit of faith. But he also had doubt at the same time, which means what? It means faith is actually compatible with 
doubt. Let's break this down for a second. Because I can't stand when preachers preach on this and they beat Peter up. Let's put this in perspective. There were multiple disciples in that boat. And they all, the text says disciples, plural, they all said it must be a ghost. So they all doubted it was God. They all were carrying a boulder of doubt on their backs. But it was only Peter who had a little bit of faith. And that faith compelled him to step out onto the water and walk towards Jesus. Sometimes it's a mustard seed's worth of faith in spite of having doubts, which is what really matters because it's belief in Christ Jesus. And just in case you thought, I was trying to give you the impression that you should go about your entire life having a little bit of faith and a whole lot of doubts. This is the beginning of Peter's Christian walk. It's, it's called a Christian walk. It's not an event, which means our walk is a step-by-step-by-step by step by step incremental process, knowing that even if we have doubts, who is the main character of the story? Jesus is. So even if we doubt, and even if that boulder pushes us down into the water, the good news is that he's going to be right there to say, you know what, Peter, you're my boy, you had doubts, but come on up. Because don't get it twisted. doesn't matter if it's belief with, it's belief in Christ Jesus. Now back to Peter. This is where Peter began his walk with God. How does Peter end up? I'll tell you, of all the apostles in the New Testament, Peter is mentioned the most. And how did Peter die? He was crucified upside down. So he began with a teeny tiny amount of faith and a whole lot of doubt. That's how his Christian walk began. But as he took a step and a step and a step, eventually he reached Jesus. And he had so much faith, he willingly gave of his life and was crucified just like Jesus. That's an imitation of Christ. Few people could ever say that they could execute. Now, before we leave this point alone, we have to go back to our boy Nicodemus in John 3. Because when we take a step back, what is John 3 really? It's basically a man who had doubts who had uncertainties. And he approached God and said, hey God, how can these things be? I'm uncertain, I'm unsure. And what happens when we ask God sincere questions, he gives us profound answers. The reason why we have John 3.16 and everything Jesus says in John 3 is because someone with a little bit of faith but had doubts wanted clarification. I almost want to say that Nicodemus read James where it says, if you're unsure and want to know something, ask God. But I can't say that because James wasn't written yet. And here's the even more pleasing news. Just like Peter... Nicodemus began in John 3. But where did Nicodemus end up? John 19, verses 38 to 40. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came 
bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. So check this out. The man who first approached Jesus in the darkness is now anointing the body of the crucified Christ with spices and aloes in the daytime. And they would have asked him, Hey, Nicodemus, where are you going with that cart full of 100 pounds worth of spices? What are you doing? And he would say, I'm going to anoint the body of Christ Jesus. And they would say, wait a minute, that crazy guy, aren't you the one that had all these doubts and approached him by night? To which Nicodemus would respond, don't get it twisted. It doesn't matter if you have belief with. What does matter is simple. Belief in Christ Jesus. Because the best news is this. It doesn't matter how much doubt or reservations or uncertainties we hurl at God. None of that will ever change the fact that Jesus Christ incarnated. He lived, he died, and he rose again three days later. Final point. Third complication. The third thing that complicates your relationship with God is you never got the full story. You never got the full story. So my iPhone is simple and complicated at the same time. And simplicity does not imply a lack of sophistication. So my iPhone, for example, I can tap one picture and I can read an email from someone halfway around the world who wrote a message to me in a different language. It's simple. It's easy to use. But the reason why the iPhone is so simple is because there's a lot of complexity. There's technology and coding and microchips and batteries that allows the phone to serve such a simple purpose. So in preaching this message simple, I'm not trying to suggest that the other 1,700 pages of the Bible are unimportant because it's the complexity and richness of all of God's word which allows the simplicity of the message to carry over. Everything begins with the simple concept of belief. Because if you're praying, for example, to someone you don't trust in, well then what is the point of prayer? And if you're worshiping, for example, of someone you're not committed to, the worship therefore becomes formless and void. Other part is this. You never got the full story. If I told you my iPhone was something you can take a picture of yourself with and then stopped, you would probably say, all right, I mean, it may have some value, but I don't see how this relates to my life. But if I gave you the full story and I said, it's a phone that you can take a picture of yourself with, which you can send to a family member that you haven't seen in six months, or use that phone to listen to the word of God anytime, anywhere. And you can communicate with others who don't even speak the same language as you. Now that you have the full story, you begin to see the value of what we're talking about. So what is the full story? What is the grand arc of the Bible? And what is the simple message that God is trying to convey to us in the totality of his word? 
And the answer is simple. It's a story which starts in the beginning. It's a beginning where God knew everything that would happen from that point on forward. He knew everyone who would reject him. He knew everyone who would despise him. But in spite of all of that, he still decided to go ahead and go through with everything. Because of the grace, the love of God is so real that he said yes to humanity, even in spite of those who would always say no to him. So when the Bible says, in the beginning, God, that very fact touches upon the grace, the hesed, the loving kindness of God Almighty. He provided for our first parents, Adam and Eve. He put them in paradise. He gave them a garden where there was no want or need. But in spite of God's provision, Adam and Eve decided, we don't want you, God. We'd rather live a life without you. So as a result of that, because God was just, he simply couldn't say never mind to sin. But the grace of God had already put in a plan to redeem his fallen creation. So Adam and Eve were exiled. Fast forward some times later, God now focuses attention on a particular group of people, the Israelites. And he puts them in a symbolic garden, in a symbolic paradise called the promised land. But again, given the option of obeying God and doing their own thing, they choose to forget about God. And so they were exiled from their garden, their promised land. Because the justice of God couldn't say, never mind to sin. But the mercy of God spoke through his prophets that said, one day, there's going to be a man that comes that ends all of this, who's going to rescue everyone from the grips of sin. Fast forward some more. It is then that God pierced the veil of our existence and incarnated as a human being. And his name was Jesus Christ. He took the form of a human being because he wanted to make things simple. He wanted to reach us where we are. He didn't want to be far away. You no longer had to think of someone way out there in the clouds. You could walk up to him, talk to him, and break bread with him. And he wanted everyone for generations to come to believe, so he had to take the form of a human being. He had to be relatable. He had to be so near you could use your senses to actually get to know him. And God wanted those, the eyewitnesses who followed him his entire life to provide a reliable testimony. So he chose specific people to write about Jesus. He chose a tax collector. Why? Because as a tax collector, he was used to people lying to him. So he had a very, very discerning eye. So he specifically chose him, Matthew, to write about what Jesus said and did. He chose a fisherman by the name of Peter because he wanted an everyday, regular guy to tell a story to regular, everyday people. And later on, he chose Paul, who was formerly Saul, a guy who spent the first half of his life rejecting and killing Christ's followers, who then had an experience and became a follower of Christ. He said, look, you started your life out as hating me, and now you love me. That's a wonderful testimony, which is why I need you to be on my team. He specifically chose the Romans to be the empire in which Jesus grew up in, because he wanted us to believe. He didn't send Jesus to a out-of-nowhere village with three people in sub-Saharan Africa. He chose the most powerful nation at the time on the face of the planet. So when the Romans crucified Jesus, everybody knew about it. 
And he chose the Romans because of one thing they were good at, it was killing people. So when the Romans crucified Jesus, it wasn't a mock-up. It wasn't a trial run. They really killed him on a real cross, and he was dead, dead, dead. And God wants us to believe. He wants us to use our senses. He wants us to embrace the eyewitness testimony to make us realize that he's not far away, but he's right here. And once again, even though God provided for humanity, they once again said, God, we don't want you. And they took Jesus and put him on a cross. And they nailed him to it. They mocked him. They tortured him. They said, you are not the Son of God. You are not the Messiah. We don't want you. We'd rather have you dead than have God walking among us. And as Jesus hung there on the cross for hours and hours, he could have taken himself down and struck everyone who hated him down immediately. But he didn't, because just as it was in the beginning, God refused to leave creation alone. And he could simply not say, never mind to sin. So Jesus had to stay up there. So his life of perfect obedience could now pay the legal price to wipe away the debt of guilt and sin forever. And then Jesus dies. And they put him in a tomb. Then there was silence. Just like the gap between the Old and the New Testament, there was silence. People lost hope. They said, has God really gotten fed up with us? Has he left us forever? And they waited, and there was silence. Still more silence. But then, on the third day, the woman, the women came to the tomb, and they found the stone rolled away, and they peered inside and saw no body there. And then Jesus appeared and said, why are you crying? This is not a time for sadness. This is not a time for melancholy. This is not a time for lamentation. Because the good news is, as written right behind me, that he is now risen. And because he is now risen, the same one who eternally conquered sin and death is now the way back into the garden, the way back into paradise, the only exclusive bridge between the realm where we are lost back to where we belong with our Father in heaven. And Jesus appeared to all of his disciples and hundreds and hundreds of more people. And he preached a message that was so powerful, it changed everything. Because now a life that was destined for damnation has now been given the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And it was a message so powerful, he commanded all of his disciples to go out into the world and tell everyone about him. Because as God sent Jesus, now Jesus sends us. So as it's now clear, from the beginning of Genesis 1-1, God has been fighting for our sakes and has refused to ever leave creation alone. And you may ask yourself, wow, now that I hear the full story, it kind of makes sense. How can these things be? To which I would say, it is so simple. Because God so loved the world, 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. God bless you.